Hello everybody and welcome to another Comedian's Interview for my blog A Rich Comic Life. My name is Richard Gill and my blog describes my experiences of watching over 800 comedians and counting over the last 46 years. I'm delighted today that my guest is the wonderful Mr. Marcus Brigstock. Yes! Hello mate! Hey Rich, you alright mate? How are you? Very good, I'm in a very fancy uh, Holiday Inn Express in Leeds. <laughs> Ooh! Yes, I know. <laughs> in, a, in a very closed, uh, um, I'm next to the Royal Armouries Museum, which is still shut despite the rest of Leeds opening up today, but it's quite nice actually, yeah, just yeah. nice to be anywhere. Exactly, yeah, yeah. It took me, I, I went to get my hair cut this morning for the first I time can see. in six months and I had to queue for three hours. Oh my God. <laughs> I think it's been worth it though. Do you know what? I bought, I bought a good pair of clippers and I'm not sure I'm going to waste any further money on hairdressers. I might just, uh, <laughs> might just carry on doing it myself. Oh mate, it's, it's, it's so good to see you and have you do this. Um, we're going to spend about an hour talking about your career in comedy and well, think, let's see let's I, see how long we last <laughs> <laughs> i think i need more than an hour um can you ask me first off please can you tell me how did you become a comedian in the first place yeah i can so i um i was always a big big fan of of comedy yeah. and i had uh, the whole of Robin Williams live at the Met memorized, which wow. is actually no no big feat because I've always been able to remember any stuff that I liked. I could just I saw the young ones once and I could do half the script. Same Blackadder and Robin Williams live at the Met. I watched um, over and over again and I knew it all. And I tried to go. I tried to get a place at drama school and I didn't get in. And a friend of mine. I was really sad and he said well look i don't know why you want to be an actor you're shit at it anyway um you should do comedy and i said along the lines of i went you can't just do comedy and he went i don't know man i think you can and i was like you know you can't no you can't because i just didn't know how anything worked you know and he is my dear friend james who sadly is no longer with us but he he made some calls and Kiss FM were running a comedy competition in London. Right. They did a cabaret night sponsored by Kiss FM radio. And uh, he booked me on it. And uh, he said, he phoned me up and he said, you better write something, it's next week. So I wrote, <laughs> I wrote a set and I walked in and I was booked for seven minutes. And the first four minutes were terrible. I died hard, it was really, really bad. And then the last three minutes, three or four minutes, I turned it round, and by the end, the audience really liked me. You know, but it wasn't good. I, like I wasn't, I wasn't great, but there was something, and the audience really liked me. And I ended up, I came second in the competition, first go, and Brilliant. I was like, "Congratulations!" Okay, well that's something. So, um, and then that was really it. Like I walked off stage, and James was there, and he went, oh, "Well done, man." And then he said, you were shit to start with, though, weren't you? And, uh, <laughs> and, but I genuinely, Rich, hand on heart, I can tell you, I left that gig and I went, that's it. That's all I want to do with my life. How that's fantastic it. is that? And then knowing, I, uh, knowing that early on. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That, so that from, was brilliant. From there, I was like, I was very... Um, I'd been through a lot. I won't get bogged down in this, no, but no. I'd been through a lot. You know, like I'd nearly died. I, I, I'd been through rehab. Yeah. I'd lost, you know, but friends of mine had died from addiction and I'd worked on an oil rig and I'd done all sorts of weird stuff, you know, yeah. and I got sober and all of that. And so when I worked out what I wanted, yeah, I was like, I was very driven and I got a place. I went to Bristol University and I arrived there and I was like, do you want to do comedy? And if people were like, uh, yeah, but I don't know, maybe. I was like, no, that, not you, not you. Uh, but with others, with Danny Robbins, who's just written the Battersea Poltergeist, he was my first comedy partner. We yeah. were a double act. And Dan Tetzel, who just directed my um, Devil May Care show, still yes. 20 yeah, years, yeah. On, years yeah. on. The two of them were and are brilliant. Like, 
sensational comic creators. They've written tons of stuff together, Rudy's Rare Records amongst, you know, the Museum of Everything that we did together and stuff. Yeah, yeah. So I worked together with them at university a lot and made all of our mistakes kind of as you're supposed to at uni. And so by the time I got to London as a comic in about 97, I was good. You know, like I, I wasn't amazing, but I was good as a stand up because I'd done it a lot. Yeah. yeah. I did a lot. And that, you know, young comics, new comics ask how, like, what should you do? How do you get good? You gig a lot. That's it. Yeah. yeah. And either comedy will chew you up and spit you out because it, you know, it's a, it's a meritocracy. You're not going to make it if you're not funny. There's no faking it. You can't, you can't fake it. You can only make it if you, if you're good. And, uh, or you'll get better. You know, like James Dowdswell was a comic who was around in those times. And I hope I hope he won't think this is disloyal or anything, but like he wasn't good. He wasn't funny. He was funny about one gig in one gig in five, maybe something, maybe better than that. But James was always like good enough. And then he got better and better and better. Now, of course, he's brilliant. He's a yeah, fantastic yeah. one. Yeah. He's really good and a lovely bloke as well. But, like, that's what I mean. Like, you, you just keep gigging and either it will spit you out or it will scoop you up. Yeah. And I, I was lucky and loved it. And so I got scooped up early and I won the BBC New Comedian of the Year Award in 97. No, 96. Yeah. Yeah. At, the, at the Edinburgh Festival. And that was it kind of the beginning of me being full-time professional comic so you're you're right about experience you had to you had to keep gigging and whether yeah. you had your good gigs or your bad gigs it's all experience and you learn as you go along um, yeah. did you have um i i if a new comedian comes along who i know i will go along and support them as their five minute buddy did you yeah. have was was it that sort of scenario when you first came to London, or did you not need to do that because you felt you were good enough to? No, I mean, minutes, well, twenty minutes. It was when I first came to London. I had by the time I sort of played London, yeah. uh, I'd already won the BBC New Comedy Award, right. and I'd already I was a a by you know a fortnightly compare a brilliant club called the Comedy Box in Bristol, which we used to be in uh at the bristol flyer yeah. uh, uh anyway it doesn't matter but so i'd had a regular comparing gig friday and saturday two months uh, two weeks a month and i was gigging you know yeah, so I, yeah, when i got yeah. to london and people like i remember you know like dominic holland people that i knew yeah because they were a little bit famous john maloney the likes of them you know and seeing them and being like, oh my God, I know who these guys are. And Dom, <laughs> Dom Holland was like, he, Dom came up to me and he's he's very straight Dom. You know, he's Spider-Man's yeah, dad. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and uh, so he came up and went, yeah, very funny. Very funny indeed. <laughs> yeah, very good. Just a small thing. No one will thank you for going over your time. Yeah, good luck. <laughs> And he was very like that, Dom. But, so like when I got to London, there were a few people who thought, wow holy shit this guy's amazing like he's come out of nowhere but i hadn't come out of nowhere i like anybody else who's even a bit good at comedy had done it loads yeah yeah, there's only reg, yeah. i saw reg hunter's second gig wow and uh, reg hunter was very good on his second gig he was amazing you know really really good i saw and when did I, f I don't know how many gigs Michael McIntyre had done when I first worked with him, but I saw Michael early on and you were like, I mean, it was fucking annoying. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, but no, he was. And like, I don't mean that in, a, in how I think a lot of comics are like, they just hate him. I don't at all. I think he's brilliant. Yeah, yeah. But he did too long and he was relentless, you know. Mm. Uh, but also you couldn't help, you only had to look at him and go, yep, I mean, that's it right there, isn't it? That's how that's how you do comedy my, and every every my, time i saw people who were good i just was lit up i was like oh my god you know and i got great gigs man like i was only i was only a few years maybe two years into my career and bill bailey asked me to be his support act oh. on tour and like so i did 
it wasn't that many it was only like maybe 12 15 gigs at the start of bill's tour yeah yeah once everything was up and running you know he did the rest without me uh, which is a nice way of saying I got fired. But like, <laughs> I watched Bill. I watched Bill every night, and j- just was like, oh, "This is, this is so great." Mm-hmm. I just and I used to. I shared flats in Edinburgh with Ross Noble, mm-hmm. and obviously, you know, like Ross is nothing like me as a comic, and I'm nothing like him. But to watch someone who's got that ability to literally weave comedy out of the air. Yeah. He takes a word and he, he, he just flies. He's extraordinary. Yeah. yeah. It's like, I don't like magic, Rich. I, I never have. I don't, I don't like magic tricks. But for me, like real magic, proper magic, mm, mm. is that, is mm. seeing a comedian take something that did not exist, mm. a concept, an idea, didn't exist a split second ago, and the next thing you know, they've spun. Yeah. It's elaborate. It's incredible to watch. Extraordinary. And, you know, obviously now, you know, Rachel Paris and I are married and I see her doing her improv stuff. And, like, we improvise together, as you know. But even now, having, you know, lived with, married and been in love with Rachel for some years and worked with her for many years before that, even now I watch her do what she does and I'm like, that's magic. Like she created something out of thin air yeah. it didn't exist and then there it was and it still to this day 20 something years on my heart just gets bigger when i see it and my head goes boom and just explodes when i see it because it's i have a very childlike love of comedy i think you do too you know yeah very much so i i just just listening to you um reminded me of my first trip to the comedy store I first came down to London in 1988 and on the bill John Maloney was MC Steve yeah. Gribbin played Linda Smith was on the bill God bless her Hattie yeah. Hayridge Richard Morton and top of the bill was um, uh, um, a, a comedian called Charles Fleischer who was a yeah. wild American voice yeah. man and he was never heard of again because he went off to voice Roger Rabbit. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Amazing. <laughs> and I thought, Thank God Amazing. I've seen him, you know. Yeah. But, but, what, a, what a great bill, man. Oh, and was, two, yeah, and two, women, I was two women on the bill at the comedy store. Yeah, it got less yeah. progressive after that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Linda, Linda and Hattie were just fantastic. Wonderful, but, but yeah. They, 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 they used to gig together quite a bit yeah. and, and, and they were great. That's uh, just hearing you uh, talk about um your love of comedy it's exactly the reasons why i've wrote wrote this blog um Mm. when i when i first started writing it i went on a writing course just for half a day and the woman who was running the course said um, we can't remember why we've invited you and i was with quite a few of other reviewers it was all very stuffy and everything and all these other people wanted to be reviewers and uh, i said well I'm not a reviewer, I'm not a diarist, I'm not a critique, I'm not a reporter, I'm a member of the audience and I'm out to have fun and enjoy myself and this blog is going to be an enthuse to all these people who actually get up and have a go and do it and uh, I hope my passion does come across because I, 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 your story was wonderful, it really was. I, I, I saw Michael McIntyre in edinburgh play a little tiny hut i saw peter k on a bill of five acts before he was famous and he was fourth on and i laughed so hard at him i missed the fifth act <laughs> ah, yeah. um the first gig i ever saw was les dawson in scarborough on holiday hey, it was amazing that, that is so cool yeah. like i'm a big 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 fan of les oh, dawson i've got a wonderful picture of les on my big comedy wall at home it's all covered in black yeah. and white prints you'll have seen it from the lip sync videos yeah, and stuff yeah, yeah. and there's a wonderful picture of les with a, a taxidermy bear leaning in like this and he's just <laughs> he's pointing at it like and i i've always assumed he's doing some sort of mother-in-law joke about yeah. the bear. <laughs> you know, have you met the mother-in-law <laughs> he uh other than Morecambe and wise who i wish i'd got to see i've I've read everything about them and seen loads of places. Yeah. He's number two on my, on my top. Three. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think... He's just the, hilarious. 
It was funny, wasn't it? When when the alternative came along, mm. the baby got thrown out with the bathwater. You know, we understand now. People get it now. But like the mother-in-law joke existed within a certain context. And the context was simple. It was most married couples lived with the mother-in-law after they got married. Yeah. That was it. You know, like you couldn't afford to move out, especially yeah. in that period you know, after the war and all the, all the rest of it, yeah, lots yeah. and lots and lots of young couples would live with the mother-in-law or perhaps next door or whatever. And, and she was a force in a, in a young man's life. And, you know, all right, you could certainly argue that some of Les's uh, jokes about the mother-in-law were sexist. I don't think you could say they were misogynist. They weren't full of hatred, but, mm. but they were beautiful. And his... It was seaside postcard humour. Yeah, think. but but he he Les straddled this seeming to be very obvious with an absolute poet soul, and I, I know I'm not saying anything that hasn't been said about him before, but really a poet soul, and you know that that oh, the old joke of his, you know, as I, I looked up at the starry firmament. And I thought we must get a roof on this time. <laughs> I was just you know, thinking like, that. It's, There's it's, always a, a cut of an uh, end line that is incredible. Yeah. 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 yeah he's and you could see, you could see him straddle that yeah. world yeah. between the quite obvious and and really, you know, high culture, high art. His ability on the piano and as a poet yeah. and yeah. Yeah. and writer, I just endless. And the, uh, you know, as I've got older as well. I follow on Twitter a uh, um, uh, 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 Kenny. Um, oh God, Ken, uh, Kenny from the um, Carry On. Kenneth Williams. Kenneth Williams. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I follow, uh, and they, and they just keep posting Kenneth Williams stuff. Yeah. And you go like, oh yeah, yeah wait, this is much more than the um, yeah. than the than the voice that people <laughs> tend to have a go at. You know, uh, so much more. A vast cultured brain oh, uh, yeah. you know a man well, they all had them they all memorized them. Yeah. huge chunks of shakespeare and of, yeah, the, yeah. of, of yeah. the great poets and stuff and yeah. i'm filled with admiration for those oh, those incredible. comics my yeah. my my favorite les dawson story i saw him twice i saw i saw him do his solo show and then i saw him star in run for your wife the ray cooney farce oh, just before did he you? and he knew it was a terrible play it was an awful yeah. farce but the cast included Jan Hunt and Gordon Honeycomb, which, wow. you know, it's just like, wow. Yeah. And he walked out. There was an audience of about five. There was me and my girlfriend, and there was a woman next to me with a baby. And the baby was crying. And he walked out, and he started doing 10 minutes of stand-up before the play yeah. started because he knew it was going to be terrible this baby was crying he jumped down went up to the baby and he went i don't want to lower the, i don't want you crying i want you smiling and the baby stopped crying it was oh, incredible and, uh, and and i said this to i met his wife tracy because there were, i was at a book signing and she said oh she said that was les that was he i'd love to have met him he was so yeah 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 him. Well, anyway my... let's move on let's move on because we're talking sure, about sure. Now. um how do you remember all your stories and routines when you're either you're on stage or online uh so when i write a new tour show i i rarely write it out ever yeah. Yeah. I write a lot of notes, and then this I I learn I learn decent I learn and develop stuff the same way I got good at comedy, which is do it lots. Yeah, I book a I book a ton of previews, and I say to the audience, uh, please please don't laugh if this isn't funny, because I am trying to work out what's good and what's not, and you need to know if I fail, I'm fine. I will not be hurt. I know it looks awful and it, your bum hole heels over and you want to, you're like, oh no, oh God, it's not working. The guy on the arse is so painful. But I'm like, don't rescue me. Just let me fall because nothing will happen. And then I'll find the next bit. And the next time I do it, I either drop that whole section or I come back to it and work harder, do it better. And basically in doing that process, naturally rubbish falls away. And then the good stuff just 
sticks. Yeah, yeah. You know? yeah and I yeah. work, I probably, in Edinburgh, I probably work from notes these days because I'm, you know, mid to late 40s now. I work from notes a bit more in the right. first three, four shows. Yeah. Just, just one word prompt so I, I remember what's next. It doesn't take me long. I don't find it difficult. Yeah. I've learned, you yeah. know, I did a play called um, Fully Committed mm -hmm. in which I played 70 characters on my own wow. in an hour and 10 minute <laughs> stage show. Uh, and they're all ringing into a restaurant so you're taking the calls and you're being the person who's calling and you're the maitre d and the chef and the restaurant manager uh, and your own colleague and like it, that was an uh, you know a nightmare to learn in lots of ways but the human brain's remarkable it's yeah. full of elasticity and walking is far more difficult than remembering um stand-up routines and most people learn how to do that you know so so you toured in 2007, 2007, with your show Planet Corduroy, and then it was followed by God Collar in 2009, which subsequently became a book. Um, yeah. Where do you get your ideas from, in particular for solo shows? Because you've done many. Well, Planet Corduroy was a big one for me. Put that out on, on DVD, and I was able... Like, the, the title, with hindsight, makes a lot of sense in that... I wore corduroy suits all the time. My production company is called Corduroy Productions. I genuinely love corduroy. I think it's a wonderful fabric. I think it's interesting and comfortable. Uh, so there's all that. But, but the, yeah, yeah, yeah. I do, happily. Well, I am a lifetime honorary member of CAC. Well, there we the, are. The Corduroy Appreciation <laughs> Club, uh, who meet on the 11th of November, that being the date which most closely resembles corduroy. True story. <laughs> Uh, That's brilliant. <laughs> so I, so Planet Corduroy was, uh, you know, the idea of this world that I was inhabiting at that time, which was increasingly politicised, and um, you know, the suggestion, broadly speaking, was, come with me to this to this world that is corduroy led, because you can't <laughs> you can't be too toxic if you're wearing corduroy. It's too silly. Yeah. Um, so that it was sort of like very angry, which I like doing, and I I only wind myself up about things that I already care about. So it's sort of real and fake at the same time. But Planet Corduroy was a way of being all of those things, and also going, "This is all daft, isn't it?" <laughs> so it was that, um, and then um, my friend James died. James, who who got me that first gig. Oh dear. And. Uh, and he was only 32 or oh, something, yeah. 33. Yes, yeah, it, it was tragic, man. Yeah. Really, really, really tragic. Um, and I was an atheist and I was very in the atheist gang. Mm -hmm. You know, I knew Richard Dawkins at that time and I a big piece that I'd written for the Now Show had gone viral in the days when going viral wasn't no one had that term you know but it was like millions of people heard the, the piece i did yeah but what i actually found was was being and remaining politically opposed to religion i mean faith is is what a person believes and religion is how you politically organize yourself into the groups yes so yeah. you might believe in god and this person might believe in god but this person a believes that God talks through a man in, in Rome and person B thinks that God made all of everything that he wanted mankind to know available to the Prophet Muhammad. And the Prophet Muhammad has one set of political beliefs and the Pope has another set of political beliefs, but they both believe in the same God. So religion is politics. And on that basis, I've never been shy about attacking all religions and yeah. god collar was about that but really what it was about was me as an atheist going i miss my friend i wish i believed in heaven because i want him to be somewhere where i could talk to him and feel that he still existed and feel that he was talking back and actually if we're going to go there i wish there was something 
more comforting for me. I wish there was a place I could turn that is a bit fairy tale and is a bit uh, unknowable in the way that, that God is uh, for comfort because I feel sad and I miss my friend. And well, that's, uh, that's, that's wonderful, though, because you're acknowledging that fact through a comedy show. Yeah, and so I'm it was sure really he important. would be very proud to have you as a friend for doing that. Yeah, I hope so, man. I mean, I, the, the, the big, the big sort of bit at the end of, of that show was about him and about his son, actually, yeah. who's, who's my godson. And I, I remember talking to my godson about his dad and saying, you know, your dad can hear you if you need him, and you know, like yeah, yeah. he's not here but he's there, and you know. And remember, I remember thinking, why have I been so kind to a child but not as kind to myself? I need I need James to still be somewhere. So it was really about that, and and it was great. It was Daniel Kitson who gave me the the big push to do it. And Dan, Daniel wow. sort of denies he, he did this. Yeah. He like because I, I he he said what are you up to, and I said oh, I'm writing this show about God, but I don't. In the end, I don't think I, you know because I don't know what I think. And he went, well, that's the show you should do. Don't tell people what the right answer is. Tell them what you're unsure about. Yeah, yeah, and I was like, from, right. you know, yeah. I've been doing the now show for so long, and it had always been, all right, this week, funding the NHS. Here's what it is. Here's what you need to know. Bosh, bosh, bosh. Because it was a good way of doing comedy. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. Be sure, be confident, be big. Yeah. And Danny Kitson said, no, let them see you not know the answer. Let them see you struggle with it. Let them see you, yeah, just, just be lost and be vulnerable. And I don't think he, yeah, I don't yeah. think he expressed it quite like that, but that was what I took from what he said. And you know, he's he's an extraordinary comedian, oh, extraordinary is. man, Danny Kitson. Yeah. So yeah, that was where those ideas came from. And then the what the, the many shows that have followed mm. have come from a, a sort of a collection of of ideas that are that are occurring to me at any given time. I sort of I sort of build a basket. And then I throw ideas into the into that basket. And if the basket breaks and it all falls apart, it wasn't the right idea, and it gets abandoned. <laughs> but if it if it holds, then it becomes a show. So the last That's show amazing. I did was called Devil May Care, and it was me as Lucifer. It was amazing. I saw and, the you know, yeah, it was super. yeah. So I needed I needed to talk about some stuff from outside my own experience to look at something through a different set of eyes and so even though from the audience's point of view obviously it's just me with some red paint on you know i, did, I, I didn't get that until you i was <laughs> so deep inside that idea that it was such it was really liberating for me to do because i was like yes this yeah. is a way of talking about good and evil from the point of view of a a, a wonderful fictional character the devil uh, without having to concern myself too much with what I know or don't know or what I think or don't think, you know, so. It was brilliant. It was so well constructed as well. You, you'd be very proud of it. Thanks, man. Yeah, yeah. I'm really, uh, I really love that show. It's the only tour show that I've finished and then re and then revived and done more of purely yeah. because it was so fun to do. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. I think there was an element in there as well of it being um a big personal and emotional investment right. that i was like yeah i'm not done with this one yet no. so in fact i still miss it like i i will find opportunities to do um lucifer again bring it back yeah yeah, yeah. um yeah. i have seen you many many times wonderfully over the years both on tv on radio in stand-up in theater um most notably uh, I, I used to go to a lot of recordings of the Now Show and the News Quiz for Radio 4. I used to go every week. And um, we were very lucky to get into a recording of Have I Got News For You. And it was the one with Bruce Forsyth where you were guesting with ah. um, Natasha Kaplinsky. Nobody knew he was playing. It was going to be him. Yeah. And um, uh, can you tell me the differences... Um, can you describe the differences writing and performing for radio and TV as opposed to live stand-up? Yeah, I mean, 
Yes, I can, and they and they're multiple. So, um, writing, preparing live stand up is the best. Mm. That's the best there is, because it's all yours. You know, yeah. I love the transaction. I love the deal where I go right. You've come to see me. I have to make you laugh. If I don't make you laugh, I haven't done my job. That's it. So I can talk about Brexit. I can talk about morality. I can talk about conservative governments. I can talk about debt. I can talk about poshness and da da da. And that's all fine. But if you're not laughing, I'm not doing my job. And I've always tried to take that that duty very very seriously. Even with stuff like around Brexit, where people were very resistant, in yeah. some places I went to material I created. I was like, "Fuck! This is my fault." I was angry with them for for, for taking us out of the EU, yeah. and angry with them for not loving what I was doing. But in the end, that's not their fault. That's me. That's my problem. Mm. So I that that transaction with stand up is the best there is with performance is really beautiful um most people treat television far too seriously mm, mm. the making of telly is treated with with far too much seriousness but you know the shows that last are the ones where people are having some fun yeah yeah and have i got news for you it's a really good example yeah so the host whoever it is goes uh um here's a playground for two minutes play in it yeah 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 here's a subject play in it and and when have i got news for you is at its best is when it's a game of keepy uppy yeah and when paul introduces some wonderful uh idea that is just again it's that magic thing he just weaves it out of yeah, the air yeah, exactly. and, it, and ian, ian goes is that is that when ah, you know something like, right, I'll be a bit grumpy and Paul and Paul freezes and looks at Ian and says something about and if you're lucky as a guest you get to play keepy uppy yeah, 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 with an idea and that is that's golden it's it, that's yeah. the dream yeah. but, but an awful lot of telly is this sort of quite prescribed quite locked down mm. process and you know there's a lot to be said for that as well I've written lots and lots of sketch comedy and stand up and sketch you know in the Briggs Society and the Now Show and stuff like that which is is very written and that's also a, a, an exciting discipline I like writing topical because I like the pressure yeah I find the pressure helpful I used to love it on the Now Show when I would ring them up so we'd record on a Thursday as you know yeah. and we'd speak on a Wednesday and I'd go I'm doing a piece about Sainsbury's have got bloody nylon tea bags and they never <laughs> biodegrade and they're made from coal and they go all right brilliant well done <laughs> and then they phone me on a Thursday morning and go the the you know it's not this but but the Dutch have announced they're you know they're banning bacon <laughs> right and they go but no one's doing it can you do it and I'd grab it and I'd have three hours to make something wow and it's like you see this on telly all the time you know the time constraint is interesting and it's good so i've always loved writing like that i really enjoy it and when i did the late edition which was a live tv show very similar to the mash report yeah, yeah very yeah. very similar in in style not as good as the mash report but still very oh, proud of that work you know we made a weekly topical tv show based really on um the Daily Show with John Stewart yeah, yeah, at that yeah. time, you know, and that was what I was trying to make, and I was very unabashed about saying, "Yeah, we're trying to make the Daily Show," and in fact, let us go daily. This yeah. will be better if it's daily because people will know what it is. And I still think the UK should have a Daily Show. It's mad that we don't. I totally agree, and 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 you were very very near to that, as you say, because I yeah, we're close. I was we were live. Fan. I was I was an avid fan of it. My oh, thanks, my, man. my favorite story about um, have I got news for you? The Bruce Forsyth recording. We didn't know he was going to appear, and the curtains came on, and the interaction between Paul and Ian was brilliant. But when when he when Bruce Forsyth read, uh, was, was trying to read an autocue 
da 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 and, he, yeah. and I couldn't stop laughing at him trying to read the thing. And he looked over to Ian Hislop and he said in my direction, please, this is satire. And I cried ah. with laughter. And it's on the video forevermore. That was you. I laughed. So I thought, that was well, I thank you very much. <laughs> Rich, I didn't know that was you. I remember that. <laughs> please, this is satire. <laughs> It was so well done. And I, was I didn't know that was yeah, you. That's yeah, such a yeah, lovely story. Feeling. My mate's got also... a very loud clap and you can hear him clapping. And I, it's I like also didn't know. I also <laughs> didn't know that you guys didn't know it was Bruce Forsyth. Uh, well, we weren't told until, because they want, right. I, I think what they were trying to do, he was, he was coming back on TV. He yeah, had yeah. been on TV and he'd had a few flops and stuff and Merton persuaded him to do it. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, remember, he, um, he did it and he was the best, one of the best ones on. He was you remember Iraqi, Iraqi play your cards yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was superb. superb. Yeah, it was great fun, man. And yeah, me, yeah. Like, I, got, I got a free pass on my first Have I Got News For You because you know it's a scary gig for a new comic yeah, and, course, yeah. and and there are lots of things going on like firstly i'd grown up with it and so i wanted it to be good but also you know paul doesn't always like it when a comic goes on there and if paul thinks that you're doing prepared material he will he will freeze you out you know and um <laughs> He does because he doesn't like it because he's not doing pre prepared material. Right, he's improvising, yeah. That's and amazing, he yeah. and 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 he knows that if you come on with your prepped shtick, that that his it breaks the show down. Yeah, you know, yeah, it doesn't yeah. work anymore. So I got a free pass because I didn't have to do anything other than listen to everybody else and do a bit of facilitation. I got some good jokes in. I'm very. Yeah proud of it but it was a free pass because paul was very happy ian was pretending to be more out of his depth than he really was yeah yeah, yeah yeah bruce, mate, i've Dawson. been there for, for some of the great ones like i was uh, i was on the brian blessed brilliant yeah, on the yeah, brian yeah. blessed one i was also there when robert kilroy silk was a panelist sitting oh, next to yeah, paul yeah, yeah, yeah. and during the recording paul turned three times in a row and just shouted shut the fuck up <laughs> and into Kilroy's face because Kilroy <laughs> was so objectionable so yeah I've had some wow. great ones over the years <laughs> yeah. um, let's move on to Edinburgh you're, as you say you're a regular performer at the Edinburgh Fringe I go to Edinburgh every year it's my holiday I'm very lucky to go um, I, I, I go for a week and I see about 50 shows I'm absolutely shattered when I come back but I, I just love it can you tell me what your first Edinburgh Fringe was like what year was it how did you feel what were you doing yeah I can uh, so we went there was a group of seven of us from Bristol University uh, with a show called Club Seals uh, it was 1996 and we played the Southside venue. Oh, yeah. We yeah. were on after a show called Kendall Mitch Cake, which was a magician called Ian Kendall performing alongside Mitch Ben. Right. And got to know Mitch very well. Yeah. And there were some other great comics I, I got to know. And that year, so there were seven of us in the show, including Danny Robbins and Dan Tetzel, who I've already mentioned and uh, some other great guys from university and it meant that I did two solo I did at least one usually two short solo stand-up spots every night in our show yeah uh, and also the, the double act and, and all of that and that was the year I did the BBC New Comedy Award with Chris Addison and Addy van der Borg yeah and someone you may remember called Jenny Ross, who was on the Sunday show. And uh, anyway, but, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I was very lucky because obviously, you know, Addy Vanderbilt, brilliant comic. Um, he was weird in those days, I thought, but but brilliant. Chris Addison, yeah. wonderful comic, amazing. And now, you know, Hollywood, massive success story. Yeah. Uh, but I was gigging twice a night, at least. And I'd already done Late and Live and um, The Bear Pit and other gigs in Edinburgh 
so by the time it came to the new comedy award I was nervous but I was match fit yeah yeah and I won but largely because I was match fit you know I was right, gigging every yeah. single night and the others it was August yeah so most of them had a, hadn't had a gig since June yeah 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 you know? yeah so that that was the first Edinburgh. There were at one stage seventeen of us sharing a three bedroom flat. Wow! Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I bet yeah. that was uh, an experience. <laughs> yeah, it was wild. Where there were, there were seventeen of us, and we were well outnumbered by the mice. So, <laughs> but then my first solo show was immediately after the next year in '97. Uh, I did a solo show at the Gilded Balloon. Which right. was, you know, for a first show, great, fine, yeah. no, no, no problem. Didn't trouble anybody. <laughs> you know, it wasn't. It didn't set the world alight, but it was good for me to do. And I now, as you know, I mean, you love Edinburgh like I do. I think. Yeah. I say to everybody, even though for comics, you know, you can lose a lot of money and sort of lose your mind too if you're not careful. The Edinburgh, the festival is. It's unmatched in the history of the world. It is extraordinary. It's the, it's the largest annual ticket selling event in the yeah. history of mankind. Yeah. It's the biggest arts festival the world has ever seen. And what I always say to new comics is, you know when you feed a horse, right? You feed it with a flat hand. If you, if you try and push the food at the horse, it doesn't like it and, you'll, and it'll bite you. You hold your hand flat. And the horse will come and take whatever's on your hand off your hand. Well, Edinburgh's the same. Take your show there with a flat hand and offer it to the audience. Yeah, and it took yeah. me years to learn this. Yeah. Offer it. Don't smash it into their face and get cross with them because it's raining out and they're wet and they're tired and pissed off and they've been queuing in the rain and it's Saturday and too many of them are pissed. Or it's Monday and there's hardly anyone there, yeah, right? Yeah. Just hold your show in your own hand and offer it to them flat. And if they like it, they'll come and eat it. And if they don't, they won't. But it's okay. And the blissful thing with Edinburgh is you've got tomorrow to do it again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. again, and again, and again, and again. And that's it, man. Like the best shows I've seen, it doesn't look like the comics offering it with a flat hand. It looks like they're going, bah! you know, and they're, yeah. they're charging this this behemoth towards you or subtly spinning, you know, lines around you. But all of the good comics the great comics offer with a flat hand that, and it's that is it brilliant really, advice it's brilliant advice. yeah it, it, it works for edinburgh and also you know i i say especially to young comics like edinburgh's a stew it's a big stew and it's very easy to get caught up in the idea that the only things in the stew are the comedians like say jason byrne who are selling hundreds and hundreds of tickets every night or or um, Ricky Gervais comes up for two nights and yeah, sells yeah. out the castle or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not the point. The stew is made of all the things that are in it. Yeah, exactly. That's what makes a stew. And it doesn't matter whether you're a little piece of parsnip near the edge exactly. or you're, you're, you're a hulking great chunk of, of beef in yeah. the middle of it. Yeah, yeah, you're yeah. still part of the stew and that's that's the point of it really i construct every year i go i construct a very detailed spreadsheet for all my friends that are going to come and join me and i i show it to them and i say is there anything you would specifically like to see this no no it'd be really good it'd be <laughs> and i try and do a cross section of absolutely everybody because yeah. i love exploring the little rooms as well as the big venues and everything but but i i go up to carlisle every summer and of course Edinburgh is only an hour away and when I get off the train at Waverley the atmosphere just hits you then when you walk out the station yeah, it's yeah. the most amazing thing I, fir I first went in 2005 and I, I thought as soon as I go I'm going to go every year or however long it's on for you know it's extraordinary yeah um, I think I think one of the things about Edinburgh as you say like you get off the train but Edinburgh as a city yeah is so undeniable mm. you get off that train and you you will be able to hear bagpipes yeah. you will be able to smell the distillery you will as soon as you come out and i mean not from the station but you only have to walk 20 30 yards you will see the sea yeah you will also see a castle and a mountain <laughs> like it's so, it's so vivid and then and then of course in august 
you will also see within a five minute walk of that station, you'll have already seen three, four hundred posters of people going. I love it. <laughs> hopefully going with a flat hand. Hey, I made this. Would, would you like some? Yeah. And that's it, you know, like that's, that's why nice I love it. Get, it's yeah. so beautiful. Um, I, you, you've also appeared in a number of big budget films and theatre which i've seen i saw um the school for scandal in edinburgh which is ah. superb in and i also saw yeah. um uh spam a lot in the west end i saw you do your inspired king arthur turn which i yeah, have yeah. to say was incredible um oh, thanks, tell man. me how you got that role how uh, did did you have to audition for it did you what did you want it did it come along how how did it come along because you were I... perfectly cast I, thanks, man. I didn't want it because I didn't think that I was up to the singing. Right. And it really scared me. And I went and I said to them, I was like, listen, this is a dream that you're offering me here. This is like as good as it gets, but I can't sing. And they said, Are you sure? Stop me. And I, yeah, I know. <laughs> and it doesn't stop me either. But I am. Um, and they said, are you sure? And I said, no, I really can't. And they went, right, look, go over to the piano. And it wasn't John Dupre, I forget who it was, but anyway, uh, went ding, ding, ding. And they said, now sing that ding, ding, ding. And I went, la, 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 ding, 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 la, 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 ding, 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 la, la, la. And they went, if you can copy that, you can sing. <laughs> That's it. That's all singing is. Now, can you do? Can you do four notes? You can go la la la, but can you go la 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 la? And then can you do five? Can you do la 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 la? Right? And you, maybe you go out of tune or whatever. But if you can do that, you can sing. It's just a question of, like anything else, you've got to work on it. Yeah. And I can tell you this. I worked very hard on Spamalot, very, very hard. Uh, the only time I've worked harder was on Barnum, uh, which was like, obviously that was right. singing, acting, dancing, and circus oh, skills, really including, yeah, including I... tightrope walking. Wow, so, yeah. but, but with, um, with King Arthur, the, uh, I decided when I got the part, I decided not to go back and watch Holy Grail. No. I had seen it a great many times. And the thing about Graham Chapman was, I thought, and this is what I took with me into it, and Chris Luscombe, who directed it, did also suggest this, that yeah. basically, Arthur doesn't know why no one else thinks he's king. He doesn't really know why he's king. But he doesn't, he certainly doesn't understand anyone who doesn't think he's king. He just thinks... He just thinks you'll know. <laughs> I'll show up and I'll say, I am your king. And you'll and you'll be like, Of course you are, it's you. And that's so that's how that's I played it. I, I always played it from the point of view of not being angry that they didn't know I was their king, or frustrated, or violent, or anything else, but just literally a bit sort of, oh. So when the French bewildered, <laughs> yeah, when the French went, you know, yeah, the son of a silly person, yeah, <laughs> and all of that. I was, I just stayed there because, because you're like, this is a, this is absurd. I'm your king, <laughs> and the more I did that, the more I was able to lean into that. Just that sense of like, no, this is, this is not very serious, but this is serious. I'm, I'm your king. <laughs> The more I did that, the funnier it was. So well done. <laughs> and that's it. But when I did go back to the film, I believe that that's what Graham Chapman played as the yeah, king yeah. of. He yeah. played absolute certainty right. yeah. that he was that he was the king. So, and it was blissful. Well, it was you, blissful. You hilarious to watch. I played. I played alongside. Uh, some people who are so talented and skilled and they're they're very different things talent and skill they overlap but they're very different but these were talented and skilled people and hard working and kind and uh, uh and decent and you know 
um, it was just a thrill, an absolute thrill. And obviously a privilege, you know, I worked with Eric Idle. Eric was there yeah, for yeah, yeah. rehearsals, yeah. And, you know, and he's, he's become a, a mate. And yeah. yeah, it was lovely, man. Well, what well done you. It was, it, it was a superb performance and a brilliant show. Um, I have seen you mainly perform uh, Always Be Comedy, both live and online. This little comedy club is very, very dear to my heart. Um, I saw your solo shows, I said earlier, preview Devil May Care live in 2019. And during lockdown, every week, the fantastic Tuesday Night Club with your very talented wife, Rachel Paris. The shows are filled with impersonations, hilarious stories and songs. What is extremely impressive and very funny is the body of material that you perform each week. Can you tell me about the writing process for the show? Yeah, it's interesting. I was thinking about this this afternoon as I was walking over here to, to get on this, on this call with you. And actually, I would say there's a 50-50 split between creating stuff during the week, the two of us, yeah. and, you know, coming up with ideas and going, just hang on, I'm just going to make a note of that, and then deliberately, consciously exploring it to develop it and see what's what. So that's about 50% of the show. Yeah. But the other half is Rachel and I, with each other and it's interesting so on tuesdays i'm in leeds now doing steph's show yeah. and i come back and i get in at about 6 6 30 and we do a tech check at seven ish and the show as you know starts at eight o'clock yeah. and a lot of what i need to do in that hour and a half is just be with rach yeah just be with her and connect with her emotionally uh, physically, mentally, just connect. And there have been shows we've done. It. I'm not, you know, I don't think any, I'm proud to say, I don't think any of our Tuesday shows have been bad. No, they haven't. There have been yeah. some that have been notably better than others. And the ones that I think are least good, that I come away from thinking, we didn't give people quite what we hoped we gave them there. It's always a connection that's gone missing. I don't mind if the material doesn't fly because you all know it's a new show. It's an hour and 20 minutes every week and we're making it up. Yeah, yeah. So it isn't polished. Sometimes we fall into something that seems polished and it flies and it's magic and, and lovely. But, you know, so I don't mind too much about the material. I want it to be very funny, all of it. But sometimes we have an idea and it doesn't fly. So we drop it. We move on to the next thing. But if the connection isn't there, if yeah. I'm not really able to listen to Rachel and find the gap where I can say, do what I do and give her space to do what she does, then I feel disappointed. And that does go missing if I've been away or if, for example, Rachel's tired or, you yeah, know, we've yeah. it's been a, a hard year for us in, in lots of ways. And yeah. some, some weeks it's harder than others. But it's about that. It's about connection. And of, like, in a way, of course it is. Like, I know you've seen There Will Be Cake, which is the show that Rachel and Pippa Evans and Paul Foxcroft and myself do together. It's yeah, an improv yeah, yeah. show yeah. based on the idea of celebrations. Well, when that show works, we are connected to each other. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it's hard. That, that, I can't be any more specific than that. That, you know? is, that, that is really interesting because... A classic example of that, I think, is what I love from you is your impersonations as well as your topical humour, mm. your ranting. Mm. Everything is in there. And with Rachel, you've got the songs, you've got the um, characters that she does. Mm. A classic example of what I think you've just said is... Um, where, which has become a weekly thing is you, you doing the Jeremy Vine radio phoning and then Rachel appears as, as this character Margaret from Cornwall now yeah. initially correct me if I'm wrong um, Margaret wasn't there but Margaret 
developed over time whereas yeah. we all knew yeah. you could do a fantastic jeremy vine and we're all looking forward yeah. to it but then suddenly this other character appears and the two of you bouncing off each other yeah. is a it's, joy to see it's that's you're 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 100 right rich in yeah. that like that was i'll do jeremy vine and yeah. rach yeah. will help to facilitate Jeremy Vine being Jeremy Vine yeah. by by saying the things that his callers say. Loads of people calling in. Do get us a ring 288, 291 and Jeremy Vine to radio. Do we really want to even think about this one? And it was all about that. It was about watching Jeremy Vine go up his register. Yeah into the place that he has to go because of the people who call okay well that's there are lots of different opinions on this and what happened because rachel is naturally like her ability to create whole characters yeah, yeah, yeah. is like it blows my mind and obviously yeah. she, she she does she's very well practiced in well. ostentatious yeah but yeah. what's happened now is Jeremy Vine is the facilitator for Margaret from Cornwall. <laughs> we, we've done a 180 degree That's uh, turn on it, and I couldn't be happier because, as you've seen, uh, Jeremy Vine. I, like, I can't get through it. No. She makes me laugh. Yeah, so no, that's much. wonderful that she's still making you laugh as you as you're doing it. It's great. Yeah. yeah. And uh, can I just say as well that whenever I watch Eggheads now with Jeremy Vine, I can't get you out of my head. <laughs> <laughs> the impersonation. It's so lovely as well that he is so Jeremy Vine is so cool and fun and magnanimous yeah. about the number of people who take the piss out of him. <laughs> genuinely, I think he's an absolute dude. I really do. Do you like doing online gigs as opposed to live stand-up? Do you find that? Yes, I do. Yeah. I do. I mean, we we absolutely said, James Gill contacted us and went, look, Ramesh, we've done, we've done some stuff together. And he said, look, Ramesh is done with his Tuesday nights. Do you want him? And we were like, look, everyone's got to do online now so yeah sure sure but now we we don't plan on stopping no no that, we well, plan on right. continuing to do it for lots of reasons one it's creatively wonderful yeah. we love we love we, you know we're discovering what's funny at the same time you are yeah 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 we haven't done any of it before so it makes us laugh, makes us feel very happy and, you know, creatively rewarded by what we're doing. So there's that. There's also, we get to stay in our house. Yeah, exactly, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's lovely. There's also, we get to work with the person we love. Yeah. That's brilliant. Yeah. Um, it's worked out so, wonderfully. Yeah, everybody. so like it's yeah. really, it's really become something, something else. You know, I... I can't wait to get back out on stage yeah, as well yeah, yeah. and play to, to some live audiences. But yeah, long, long may Tuesday club last, you know? Oh, exactly. My, my view of it is, um, uh, I look at it as a super substitute. Um, it, uh, I don't know how I would have got through lockdown without, um, online comedy. Well, we when, feel they, the same. When, when they first launched it, there was no audio, so I was just sitting here laughing at four walls. I thought I was going to be yeah. taken away, but but it but it was always be comedy that had the bright idea to do the audio. And now I go to Jarlath Regan's Return of the the Crack. I go to the Happy Mondays Club sometimes. Mm. I've seen yeah. you at Boothby Grafo show on a on a Thursday night. Yeah. Everybody's doing it. Um, but, but James still uh, uh, always be comedy just nails it oh, you know yeah, he, yeah, he understands yeah. so well he understands yeah. how to include the front row yeah. but yeah. i hope make everybody else who's watching feel that they're part of something yeah. as well yeah. Yeah. you know it's it's a it's a, it's a, a fine privilege you know. to be part of it it really yeah. is you know um yeah. but but I can't wait to go back to live stand-up. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah, I, I love going out on a Friday or a Saturday to a live gig, and, yeah. and uh, because you're you're in that moment in the room, you know, it's extraordinary. Yeah. Um, just before we go, and I've 
I could talk to you all night. I, I, I do have more questions, but we're running out of time. Um, uh, is there anything else you'd like to say? Are you writing any books? Are you writing any series? Are, are you got any podcasts? Where can people find you on social media? That sort of thing. What am I making? That's an interesting question at the moment. Uh, I am making all sorts of things. I. I feel, a, in terms of a big show, I had a show um, that I would have toured last year uh, that was, the working title for it was Thread, right. based on the idea of, of you know, online threads, of, of like taking an idea and following it and going and going and going and then also basically talking about the internet, which is something we as humans are not yet evolved to cope with. Uh, that was the idea, but everything now is is up in the air. So uh, the truth is, I don't know, but the way that I work best is I book an Edinburgh show before I have a sh show. Right. So I book the venue, I book, I book the tour, I come up with the title and the basket that I talked about, but there's no show there when I book it. And then I have this deadline coming. And I know that on the 5th of August, uh, there will be X number of people sitting in seats that they've paid for looking at this face. And if I haven't got an hour of stuff for them, they will quite rightly be very angry and they'll <laughs> never come back again and they might even ask for a refund. So I like, I like that and I need that. And yeah, so yeah. the next big project, the next big show will be when I'm ready to tour, I will tour. I've got... I've got a big idea that I sometimes when you've got an idea, you don't even write the idea down for fear that when you do, it won't be as good as it is in your head. <laughs> and that's like, that's what stops most people from making anything ever. However, with me, it's usually the thing that I go, if this idea is still there in a month, I'll think about it more. That's if great, it's still there in six months, idea. <laughs> I'll write it down. If it's still there in a year, it's clearly something that needs to, to happen. Brilliant. Brilliant. So we'll see. We'll see. You know, as far as podcasts, no, Rachel and I are the only people we know who don't have one. <laughs> <laughs> right? I mean, everyone's got time. one. <laughs> but we don't have one. Well, the, the plan sort of is to record Tuesday Club and edit it and release it the next day as a podcast. Yeah. We should. Idea. It's a it's a funny show from which we could edit down a tight 40 minutes where there's no copyright infringements and nothing we'd say that would get us into trouble, you know, because it's a live show, but um and release it as a podcast. I think it'd be very entertaining and it would allow it would. people to hear what we're making the next day and for the rest of the week yeah, you know yeah, yeah. so that's sort of the plan but we're we're we do find you know like an hour and 20 minutes every week is a lot and is, so we're, yeah. we're busy making that and and trying to do any more with it at the moment it feels a bit more than we can manage but we will we'll get there brilliant well yeah. um do you want to tell people where you are on social media so they can go and check things out oh no they mustn't look at my social media <laughs> I want, I want people to like me. I don't want people to think that I'm a, an awful, an awful malcontent. I don't blame you. And you can imagine, you know. Well, I, I still want. My favourite is still Twitter. And weirdly, most people find Twitter the most toxic of all. But I don't. I don't. I like it. I like it. I enjoy myself on there. Well, please keep doing what you're doing. I, for one, will be in the front of the queue to come and see your new tour i think oh, you're one God of the most you, talented comedians genuinely i've ever oh come thanks from. man Thank well, Rick, so honestly i know time. i know that the 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 people who come to tuesday club on a regular basis have a good idea about how much it means to rachel and i it, that for that to happen and uh, but honestly hand on heart mate you know you and others uh have really been like a like a rope to us in in storm tossed seas you've been a rope that we've just been able to cling on to the whole time and know where we are and it means the world to us it really does it's been so special and important and i i don't think in reality i don't think i've ever had a relationship with a show 
or an audience like this before you know usually because you play to a different audience yeah, yeah. every time you go, you go out so this is really special so from i know i speak for rage here from uh, both of us to you and, and anyone who ever comes to choose a club thank you for keeping us sane well thank you very uh, much for your kind words and it, it's my pleasure it's so good to see you every week in week out and i laugh like a drain at you you know that um, uh, thank you so much for your time and pleasure, all the mate. very best to you you take care all the best thank you, you too man